Justin, Not that we've one. got somebody waiting while yeah, you everything's, get around. Everything's going fine. Who's who's up next, Noel? I mean, there's so much to talk about now. I don't even know where to start. Uh, we are going to make some pizza now and not just pizza. We're going to make some dough. We're going to learn from a true master. And so, um, waiting in the wings is somebody who I've never met except on zoom, but I'm told that she is zooming in from the King Arthur kitchen up North. Uh, is anybody there waiting to zoom in? Is that you, Jen? Ahoy, Jennifer? ahoy. Here Jennifer? we are. Welcome. All right. Enjoy it guys. Thank you, Justin. Hello, Jennifer. How are you? I can't complain. How about yourself, boss? Uh, I, I'm, I'm doing well. Thank you. I, can I'm you tell sorry. us exactly where you are for people who don't know what's yes. going on up there? So I am dialing in from the beautiful King Arthur Baking School at the Bread Lab here in Skagit Valley, Washington. Beautiful. And um, so what, what is up there? Like, what, where, where are you right now? So I, we're inside of the bread lab. So we rent a room in there and we teach classes here, but we are in the port of Skagit and we have a really amazing businesses in our area. We've got brewers, malters, millers, bakers, everything is kind of, this is like a little grain Mecca. It's awesome. Wow. Now tell us what you're going to be presenting to us today. Yes. So um, we are presenting the crispy, cheesy pan pizza, which was King Arthur Flowers recipe of the year last year. And thank God we had it. We needed that during the last year lockdown. It was a great recipe to get a lot of brand new bakers thinking about pizza. So I wanted to share that today um, with you all. So if we have home bakers on the list, let's get into the, the nitty gritty and let's do it. That's good. So I apologize. We're running about five minutes late. So I know you have this very beautiful and detailed schedule. <laughs> Let's push everything back five minutes. Right. And away we shall go. So without further ado, take it away, Jennifer. Very good. I will make the best of it. Let me change my camera here. I have a down shot here. So if you are baking along, you can do that. First things first, if you have uh, ever been to one of the baking school classes, you know that we love a uh, scale and I would encourage everyone, especially home bakers to get a scale, a pound's a pound the world around or a gram's a gram, no matter where I am, we wanna be consistent and bakers, I have control issues and maybe you do too. So scale's a great way around that. If you are not using a scale or if you're baking with someone, like I love to make this recipe with Littles. It's very, very approachable. It's kind of a do nothing dough, which is my style. If you are gonna use measuring cups, what I want you to do for this recipe is to aerate your flour, scoop, fluff it up all nice and fluffy. Then I want you to sprinkle it in until you have a nice mounded dome right there. Sweep the top off like yay. This will get you a nice, even light cup of flour. You think as a flour company, we would want you to use all the flour. We do not. We want you to make a lovely pizza. I do not want any door stops. I want nice, airy, lovely dough. So by using this method, if you are having to use cups because you don't have access to a scale, that's the way to go. I'm gonna switch back to my scale though because as previously mentioned, I have a deep and profound love for it. And I'm gonna scale into my bowl 240 grams of all-purpose flour. We're using all-purpose today because it is just widely approachable and findable. You can make it with other types of flours and we can talk about that during the folds. The next thing I'm gonna to add to my bowl is three quarter teaspoon of salt. We're gonna get into the nitty gritty of ingredient function again during the folds. Three quarter of a teaspoon of salt, please. The next thing that we'll add to our container of flour is a half a teaspoon of yeast. This is instant yeast. I love it because it can go right in the flour. We don't have to proof that in the water at all. Before I add my liquids in here, I'm gonna dip and flip. I have one of these white bowl scrapers. If you do not have one as a home baker, they're like 90 cents, bendy flexi, wonderful, worth every penny. Definitely got one. So I've mixed my yeast and my salt into my flour. This is again, great to make with Littles because it's pretty easy, pretty easy. In a separate container, because I've had a decent amount of caffeine today, I'm gonna to scale my water. That way when I overdo it, because I will overdo it, I can pour it back out nice and easy. It's 170 grams or three quarter cup. Okay. To that, I'm gonna add my olive oil, 13 grams or one tablespoon. When I am home and unsupervised, I like to use an infused olive oil here. I've got one that is rosemary, black pepper and lemon zest. 
and it's really, really nice. You do taste the flavor in the crust, but it's kind of, I don't know if that's sacrilege to anybody else. Room temperature water. Yep. Room temperature water. Thank you, Todd. I see you in the chat. We have room temperature because we're doing a long fermentation on this and littles are little kids. You want to make this with little kids. Everyone's got to start somewhere. And I'm a big proponent of baking with little kids. Every pro pizza person started off hopefully when they were wee. So let's, let's get the next generation going. So I've got my dry, I got my wet, add it together, lickety split. I'm gonna dip and flip. You could go right in there with your hand, but that does tend to lead to chicken drumstick fingers, which are funny until they are on you. We're gonna just dip in and flip in. And then I'm gonna do a little dip and flip and press. I love this recipe and I feel like it's one of the most approachable ones for new bakers because like I said, it's kind of a do nothing dough. It's kind of a do nothing dough. We're gonna bring it together and then we're gonna do a series of folds. So let me just bring it together till it looks like a dough. I'm gonna keep spinning this until it picks up the flour. I'm gonna stop. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to cover it up and I'm going to set a timer for five minutes. I'm setting a timer along with you. <laughs> All right. I think we're back on track because that was the lightning round of pizza mixing. But luckily, this is like that's that's why this recipe is so nice, because that is that's the most of the work. Love that. So during this pause point, I want to talk about flour and gluten development. So here today we use all-purpose flour. This is enough to get the job done. If you wanted to have more texture in your dough, you could level up to a high gluten flour or a bread flour. But honestly, this is sufficient. This is sufficient. So King Arthur has about 11.7% protein in our all-purpose, which is pretty beefy for all-purpose across the board. Um, it's sufficient. It's sufficient. If I saw a question in the chat go past about adding whole wheat flour to this instead, so if we did a, a whole wheat addition, I feel that that is a great idea. There is a, one of our other instructors who does 50% whole wheat in this and really likes it. It can condense the crumb a little bit, so I would encourage you, if you're going that route, please uh, adjust the hydration. Make it a, make it a little bit wetter because that bran is going to suck, suck some of that water up. The same thing is true as if you level up to like bread flour. That is that gluten is really, really, really thirsty. And we want to make sure we have enough hydration that we don't end up making a brick. So level it up, maybe put another, you know, 20, 30 grams in it, but you want to feel it. It should feel soft like taffy. If it's not soft like taffy, you'll add a little bit more. So, you know, the question in the chat, thank you, Joe. What about using double lot? It really depends on the protein content of your double lot. I know some varietals have a high and some have a low, but usually I don't adjust for the double lot. It picks up the water really fast and lovely. Super, super love that. So gluten development. The thing that I want to talk about, the beauty of this recipe is that we are not going to have to knead this we are gonna build our gluten structure through a series of folds. So traditionally when we are kneading, we're doing a sort of fold and push, et cetera, et cetera. Let's talk about the mechanics of that knead. So as we stretch it, we're taking those gluten chains that are forming in the presence of water. Gluten forms under two circumstances. One is time, the other is agitation. This recipe is abusing the time, stretching them out, we're lashing them on top of each other, and giving them a job. Your job is to trap the burps and farts of our yeast and rise our dough. So we're stretching and folding. When we're doing a hand mix, we are using agitation to bring it all together and then using folds, kind of just skipping a whole lot of that. I like this because then I can focus on other things in my life, get the dishes done, cover any other emails. I can make this dough easy peasy and it keeps forever. So if I decided to make a hundred percent whole wheat recipe for this, I would increase the water significantly because the bran in that whole wheat 
is going to kind of cut and degrade my internal crumb. So I would increase the hydration quite a bit. And I would also include a soaking stage. So where I bring it together just loosely and then let it sit for 10, 15 minutes before I start my fold process, all that good stuff. Let's think, what else do I wanna cover? I've got the five minutes and they're all broken down into little bits. What else? So maybe we can get into, start into our ingredient function. So we have a bunch of different ingredients in this, but really not so many. If we were making something like a brioche, we would be using all sorts of goofy stuff. But in this case, we are keeping it nice and tidy. Flour, water, salt, and yeast. That's it. Nothing to hide behind, which is bittersweet. It means that it'll tell the truth about you, <laughs> if either or not you want it to. So all purpose, we covered that. All purpose is just the endosperm inside of our wheat kernel. So if we put 100 pounds of wheat into the mill, we're going to get like 70 pounds out. Thank you, thank you. Oh, and oil. Thanks, Dominique, keeping me on task. Bonk, I even had a space for it. Salt is very, very, very important. We do a lot of classes here at the baking school and I have a lot of folks say, hey, you know, I am making this pizza for um, my dad or my significant other and they are on a low salt diet. What can I do? Can I leave the salt out? And I'm gonna cover that once we finish our first fold. So I'm gonna push this back. I'm gonna grab my bowl. So the first time I'm going to show you how to do a fold in the bowl, and then I can also show you how to do a fold on the table the next round. So I see a question in the chat from Carolyn. Carolyn, this is called the Crispy Cheesy Pan Pizza, and if you didn't get the recipe, you can find it on the King Arthur website. Just Crispy Cheesy Pan Pizza is right up there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my little white bowl scraper, or you can use your hands, whatever, and I'm going to stretch it and fold it to the center. Stretch it, fold it to the center, dip underneath, stretch and fold, stretch and fold. That's, that's the majority of the work right there. So I'm gonna put my little dome back on. I'm gonna set another five. So the fold is all about taking those gluten strands and giving them a job. So I'm stretching them out, I'm giving them a job and then I'm letting them forget what I just did to them. If I try to do another fold or manipulate this now, it is going to get spicy with me. It's gonna fight me. And I wanna have a good relationship with my pizza dough. If I push it, it's gonna get kind of grumpy and fight. So I'm gonna let it sit. That's what these five minute increments are for, is just for it to kind of forget what I've done to it so it'll listen. So salt, that's where we were last. Salt, if you are needing a low salt diet, I always tell folks that they should try and cut salt back from the things that go on their pizza and not cut the salt in the dough. The salt provides a couple different sort of purposes that it fills for us. The first thing that it does is it makes everything taste more like itself. If you leave the salt in, um, I usually will sell folks that forget to put the salt in, please just toss it and make another batch because it will not be edible. It doesn't matter how lovely um, it is, the pizza sauce and cheese. Don't waste your sauce and cheese. Just make the dough real quick and put the salt back in. At this point, you could put the salt in, but if it's after the proof, yeah, it's too late. Here at the baking school, we use sea salt as well. If you're using kosher salt, it's nice to have a slightly mounded spoon if you're using volume measurement. That way you get a proper amount of salt but let's talk about what it does. The first thing that it does is it competes with a yeast for water. So it slows down the yeast, it retards the yeast. Retard, if you guys play music, you're familiar with that, slows it down, retards the yeast. So if we don't have the salt, one of the things that you'll notice is that your pizza is gonna go supernova. It is gonna be massive because your yeast has had free reign. It is eating all of the starch in the flour and it is losing its mind. So we wanna have the salt to keep it calm calm if yeast can do that sort of thing. You know what I mean? Metaphor. The next thing that it does is it kind of stabilizes our dough. So the way that I like to think about it is that if we have our gluten matrix or we've kneaded it or folded it 
or whatever, um, all those little joins where they lash onto each other, it's kind of like super glue, just comes through and sticks them all together so that they stay together. And then when we have a nice rise, our bubbles stay nice and big, nice and big. There was a question here in the chat. I just saw go past. What about bread salt from King Arthur? As far as I understand, the bread salt is just like super duper fine salt. Jeff, do you know that? Oh, okay. Thank you. So Jeff, um, I'm not familiar with it. We use mostly again, just sea salt is my, my true blue, but Jeff says he's my assistant here today. Jeff Higgs, he's another one of our instructors at King Arthur. He says that he likes it. It has more minerals in it. So it's got a little bit better, a little stronger flavor. Yeah, and so he says he likes to. Okay, he says he likes to use it when there's a, a flower with low mineral, low mineral content. He can add that too. So thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that. Um, but that's that's mostly it. Sea salt's nice. You can use anything you like, though, as long as it's salt. Um, let's make sure we use that. And there's another question that came up in the chat about using yeast. So we'll get into that next. This is. Instant yeast, which is what we use here at the baking school. We use it for every single class with very few um, exceptions, very few exceptions. So this yeast is Saccharomyces cerisiae, same as you would have like a top fermenting ale yeast, same critter. And one of the questions that we get in a lot of classes is do, especially from home bakers, I go to the grocery store and I see, you know, rapid rise and bread machine and instant and active dry and oh my God, I'm so overwhelmed. Which one do I buy? And I say, you should buy, just buy instant yeast, just buy instant yeast. It all comes out in the wash at the end of the day. So just get that, stop doing that. And the other thing that I tell home bakers specifically is that if you are buying those little packets of yeast, those little tinfoil packets, stop it. If you're going to bake pizza with any frequency, level up, level up, get yourself a pound of yeast. This bad boy costs like six bucks. It's not much. Six bucks, break it into two airtight containers. We keep ours in the freezer because there's no moisture. Yeast activates in the presence of moisture. Yeast without food is dead yeast. So we keep ours in the freezer to keep it, keep it nice and dry. Six bucks for a pound, but if you're buying those in those little teeny packets, it works out to about 30 bucks a pound and that's just garbage. So Happy Earth Day, let's save garbage and save money. It's time for another fold. Back on here, the dough has loosened up and every time I do a fold, I'm noticing the texture change a little bit. It's smoothing out, it's equalizing. So I can go in here and do a little stretchy, foldy, stretchy, foldy. Stretch it out. I kind of stretch it until I feel it fighting me. As soon as we get that fight, then I fold it over. I want to make sure I work for it though. That's it. Ringy dingy, another five minutes. All right. So this is what you want to do. And then the other last and final thing that I tell, especially to home bakers that come to class, if you see one that's like this, that's smushy smushy, put this back, send it back to wherever you got it because this has had its vacuum seals to, they've, they've broken, it's popped. So there is a possibility of getting moisture included into this. And again, yeast with moisture equals active. Active yeast with no food is dead yeast. So get a brick. I could break a window with this. This is the one that you should get. And I do, thank you, James. I do store it in the freezer. There are a lot of way, a lot of folks that store it in the fridge as well, but I try and keep it in a moisture free environment. There's a question here in the chat before we get um, onto the next ingredient, and that's how do we adjust the amount of yeast for the longer ferments, 12 hour to 72 hours? So this recipe here can go up to 72 hours with no adjustment. I've made it, it's great. It gets a little bit sloppier as the, long, the longer it's in there, and we can talk about that and what's happening there. So as it ferments, actually I'm gonna put a pin in that because we are gonna come to that. I wanna show you an example. Another question here in the chat as we are moving through, why did the instructions say to use a wet hand to fold? If you use a wet hand, it won't stick to your fingers. But I am so comfortable with sticky dough hands that it didn't even occur to me. <laughs> you can do it with a wet hand if you like. It just means you won't stick quite as much. You're not gonna be able to incorporate any more water into this. So it's not to adjust hydration. 
it's all about keeping your hands um, cleaner like that. Um, and that's another thing that happens. Like if you do make this in a mixer, make sure you check the consistency of it with the hand when you bring it together. If it feels like bubble gum, you're good. You can't really get the dough to accept water once you've started to develop it with the folds. It just won't take it. So adjust the hydration up front before you play with it. But thank you for that question. The next one in is from Janice here. How long will the free will it last in the freezer with the yeast? Um, Jeff, my assistant back here, my little cohort, he had a pound and he took seven years to blow through it from the freezer. Yeah, eight years. And in, as long as you keep it sealed in a moisture free environment, it will keep and keep and keep. You can pass it down to your kids. Question here from Betsy. Thank you for these great questions. These are super fun. Then I can dial into what you want to know. I buy the pound of saff from King Arthur all the time. Works great in my bread. Does the gold label work better for sweet doughs? Ringy dingy, Betsy, you are on it. So the red label, so we'll call this red yeast, is what we'll refer to it here at the bakery. And then because we're super creative, this is the gold yeast. <laughs> So this is the gold yeast that she's referring to. This is an osmo tolerant yeast, which means it's more tolerant for sweet doughs. So anytime you have a dough with, with a lot of sugar, so brioche, Danish dough, uh, panettone, I would use the gold. Other than that, I use the red most of the time. But if all you have is gold, make pizza with it. It'll work. It's the same critter, same critter. And the way I like to think about it is that this one kind of has a raincoat on. So it's more tolerant of high sugar environments. It doesn't get robbed, the water doesn't get robbed quite as easy from it, but it's still Saccharomyces, it's the same critter. Same critter in there. Fantastic. Okay. The next one is water, and that actually works really well in with Elizabeth's question. So water is one of those understated ingredients, but it is the thing that controls the internal texture of your pizza dough. If you have a dry dough that is, you know, soft as a baby's bottom from the very, very beginning, what you're gonna find is that the inside of your pizza is gonna be tight. The crumb is gonna be tight. The wetter your dough, the bigger the bubbles are. That's the gas pedal there. So the bigger is that. In this recipe, we have a certain amount and it's wet and sticking compared to what I see in your demonstration, what may need adjustment. I think this stuff slops out the longer it goes. So it's a little bit stiff in the beginning, a little firm, and as it equalizes, it kind of slops out. So Elizabeth, I would not be bothered. And if it's a little bit wet, I wouldn't be sad. Because just like John said in the next one, why a low hydration pizza dough for this? This is first of all to be approachable to home bakers. So a lot of times home bakers, especially first time bakers, and King Arthur does get a lot of, you know, brand new, never ever picked up a thing before to start things. So we're gonna do a lightly lower. You can, there's my timer. You can absolutely level up and you will get it. So feel free to do mad science there. So I'm gonna do this one on the bench just for the fun of it. So I brought my little dough baby out. And in this case, I'm gonna pick up each side. I'm just gonna bounce it out until I feel it fighting. I don't want it to rip. And I'm just gonna bounce, bounce, bounce it. And then I do a letter fold. Then I'm gonna turn it. I'm gonna bounce, 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 bounce it out. Doot, 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 doot. And I'm gonna turn it. So that is another fold on that one. Yeah, it's getting. I think if I had, if I was home and unsupervised, I would probably add a little bit more up the hydration. But to be true to the recipe today, that's what's going on question in the chat now from Steve. Could you put a desiccant in the yeast? You totally could, but if you keep it in the freezer where there's no moisture, you can save that desiccant packet for, I don't know, something cool, like new shoes. I don't know. Put them in, put them in dried fruit. All right. So we've got one more round to do, and then we are going to move on to, I've been talking for a while. Then we're gonna move on to some of my sort of do-aheads to make sure that you can see this dough at all stages. So we've got one more fold that I owe you and I'm gonna talk about uh, the water a little bit further and then go into the oil and then we'll move on to some kind of, I guess, I don't wanna say Martha Stewart movements, but like here, check it out, we did it ahead. 
That's what we're doing. So room temperature water for this, because we're not trying to like supernova this yeast. We want slow fermentation. We are going to give it um, these 20 minutes as we fold and fold and fold. And then it's going to have 40 minutes more on the counter to get to know itself. And then we'll put it in the fridge. And we'll put it in the fridge. So I see a question here for how many folds that we need to do. We need to do four folds total. So I owe you one more fold. This last fold, and then we'll set our 40 minute timer. Just so that's clear. A question here about the oil in the bottom of the pan. Thank you, I see Nicole's working on that. Yeah, it helps with the browning. It helps us make sure we get our pizza back at the end of the day. Yeah, and not stick. <laughs> So if we used cold water, let's do a, a science here. If we use cold water, it's going to make the fermentation a little bit slower. If I was in a hot kitchen, I might consider using slightly cooler water to make sure um, the environment in which I proof doesn't make this go crazy. And if I was in the cold of Vermont, who I guess they, they just said they got like a foot of snow last week, I would probably use warmer water to make sure I get fermentation in the time allotted. That makes sense. Okay. Question from Efren, is malt recommended for any recipes that call for cooking temps at over 600? I mean, I, you can. I wouldn't say recommended or discouraged so much as, yeah. If the recipe benefits from that additional malt, that additional sugar and color, or if it's, if it's um, enzymatically active, that definitely that more sugar, then I would use it. But you will see some aggressive browning, especially if you're using enzymatically active malt. Here we go. So the last ingredient I wanna cover here is the oil. So this is what we're gonna do to help make sure that our pizza dough will extend. So this is a lean dough for the most part, meaning flour, water, salt, and yeast. This is an enrichment. So we're adding this and it's all about texture and like stretchability. So what I like to think about is these gluten chains as we're stretching them out and lashing them together if they are hands just like mine, stretching and lashing, are they gonna hold quite as well? They're gonna slip if they're oiled. So as we're stretching, I want them to be able to kind of slip. So they're just holding on, but I can get my pizza to do what I want. Great. So by putting this in here, it's all about the internal texture, mouth feel. How tender is our crumb? It's gonna help with browning when used in the pan though. Um, Annette is going to be baking with us. That's great. If you want to put it in the fridge, yours is in the fridge now, you can take it out. We'll decorate it together here in just a minute if you want. Yeah, you can go ahead and take it out. Um, but ugh, actually, Annette, you can take it out now, but there's going to be a little bit of a pause between when you take it out of the fridge and when you decorate it. So if you'd like to bake today, I would take it out of the fridge. Take it out of the fridge. There we go. I see another question here. We've got 30 seconds left before we start our little switcheroos. What's that, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in a high heat oven like the uni, are there any changes you'd make to the dough to keep it, to help it with to stand the heat? Um, I would... Yeah, I would probably go for like the, the pie crust maneuver. You know, people are baking pies. There we go. And you'll put like tin foil around the outside. I don't have a whole lot of experience with the uni specifically, but that would be my, because I know they are gnarly hot, which is great. But in this pizza that takes like 18 minutes to bake, they're a little high test. So I would, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would just tin foil it, I guess, halfway through or anytime you're seeing the colors getting on too much. That way the, the inside's fully baked. So I owe one more fold and then we set a 40 minute timer. So I'm gonna stretch it out, fold, fold. This one is just in the air, stretch it out, fold, fold. North, south, east, west, I've got a little delicious cinnamon bun. I'm gonna set a timer for 40 minutes. It's gonna get 40 minutes to get to know itself here on the counter before it goes into the deep freeze. And by deep freeze, I mean fridge. Don't, don't freeze it, please. I'm gonna do a little fast forward in time. Higgs, will you show, hand me that bowl? Thank you so much. What's up? Oh yeah, thank you. So my kitchen elf has just brought me a bowl. I've passed forward in time. Let's zoom in here and see this guy, see how it's changed over time. So this has been in the fridge for uh, 24 hours. 
Let's take a look at the texture. So as I pinch it and pull it, it's firm, but it's very, very strong. I got nice strength and good extensibility with this dough. Really, really nice and easy to put in my pan. That's the next thing that I'm gonna do. So let me get my pan right here. So I've got a nine inch across the bottom cast iron pan. Make sure it's well seasoned. This is in almost two seasoned. We find that we use ours here a bunch and they are, they're good. Um, but make sure yours is well seasoned if you wanna get your pizza back. I'm going to put my 18 grams or, I don't know, a good swizzle in the bottom of the pan. I'm gonna make sure I get all around the edges and there we go. 18 grams is excessive, is that by design? What it's gonna do is it's gonna help our pizza come back. And again, this recipe is for home bakers specifically. And sometimes the, uh, <laughs> sometimes they need a little extra. But the beautiful thing about this is that it is to your taste, so you can do it. Dial it back. So I've got my dough in here. I'm gonna flip it over and just cover both sides and I'm gonna press it out and into the corners of the pan. If you're finding that it won't go, just come back to it in a minute. Give it a couple seconds to relax and forget about what we've just done to it and press it out. So as easy as that, that is like the least work I think I've ever done for pizza. So there's a question here about from Vicki about a 12 inch cast iron pan. So Vicki, I'm going to dial you towards the website, King Arthur's website about pan sizes, or you can do pi r squared to discuss, to determine the volume of your pan. But a 12 inch pan is gonna hold a heck of a lot more dough than a nine inch across the bottom pan. So you might need like a recipe and a half or a double recipe to make sure you get the depth that is expected. So in theory, yes, but you may not get the depth that you're looking for. So this is gonna sit out on the counter. I'm gonna cover it up. It's gonna sit out on the counter for a few minutes, uh, about you know an hour, hour or two hours, depending on where you are. What I wanna do is make sure that when it's completed and it's ready, it's jigglicious. Let me sub that over. I've got the next step. So here is one that we did ahead and it's been sitting on the counter now, I think for two hours, it's kind of chilly here. Ways to tell that it's done is it's nice and puffy. When you shake it, you get that sort of jello salad wobble, 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 wobble. And then we can dress it up for the ball. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna sprinkle our cheese. This recipe calls for 106, 170 grams, six ounces, or one and a quarter cups loosely packed to go on the pizza. So you put about a cup on up front, nice full coverage across the top of the dough. Make sure you get all over. I want that free go. Oh yeah, dingy dingy. Then we're gonna put our sauce on top, little tiny dollops of tomato sauce. I heard you guys are doing a sauce off, so I am looking forward to seeing some super exciting sauce options from y'all. Wrong timer. I sent it for the wrong time, but that's okay. It needs to have about 40 minutes on the counter. So that is it's a third to a half of a cup, baker's choice, make it the way you like it. I am a saucy kid, so I'm gonna just go towards the half cup mark. Then we are gonna hit the top with that remaining quarter cup just to kind of bless the pizza. Just give it a nice little blessing here. <laughs> I like the sauce on top of the cheese. The cheese is gonna protect, that bottom cheese is gonna protect um, the crust from getting soggy as it goes in the oven and it's gonna grizzle up and give me that mm -hmm on the sides. This is then ready to go into the oven and bake off. It'll take 18, 18 or so minutes, maybe longer depending on your oven. And we'll finish it off at the end with some herbs and cheese. So I'm gonna fast forward again here, clean my station, I made a mess. I've got one that has come out of the oven right here. So we got this all grizzled up on the side. It's got, got a little dark on the side for me, but I'm gonna eat it. Just saying. I'm gonna, yeah, we had, we were baking baguettes earlier and the oven was a little, a little handsome on the top, but
but here it is. We can take it out of the pan. Let me show you how to get it out. So when it comes out of the oven, please use an offset spatula just to make sure your za comes out and then sneak underneath, pop that bad boy out and then lift it onto your serving plate. And we'll take a look at that. So here's our pizza. You can finish it with some snipped, oops, let me get in frame there. Some snipped herbs or ripped herbs. I've got some oregano because that is my preference. But you can do whatever you like, artfully placed here. Here we go. And cheese if you like. But I want to cut this open and see you, uh, show you the inside of it. So I'm not going to sprinkle cheese on it. Just imagine that there's more greens in cheese because when I open it up, it's all going to fall off. So let's get it cutting. It's really nice and crispy on the edge. My knife is making that happy sound. We can open it up and see the middle. We've got semi-open crumb. Again, I feel if I was home and unsupervised, I could have pushed the hydration and got a little more bubblage. But at the end of the day, that's not suffering. That's not suffering at all. I'll eat that all day. And the bottom has got good color on it. Again, you can see the top of our oven was a little bit toasty roasty from baguettes. But that is it. We have pizza dough. If you have baked along with me today, your next steps are when your 40 minute timer goes off, put that bad boy in the fridge until tomorrow. And tomorrow, take it out and you'll start right back up at step number, I think it's number six. So you'll follow that at step six. Does that make sense? Is that feeling good? All right, we have about five minutes left in our class. We did this at lightning speed. Is there any other questions that I can address for you while we hang out or anything I can do for you, Noel? Coming back, can you hear me? I gotcha. Sorry, I'm taking care of people who are still trying to get into the webinar, it's packed. <laughs> Great. Yep. Well, so let me ask you a question. How do you, for people who maybe don't have that much experience and they're maybe using a different flower, what's the range that people can expect from sticky to dry to tell, tell people like maybe some people are using high gluten or mm -hmm. something called all purpose. To, what can we expect? Yeah. So let's talk about that. So when we're thinking about flour, you and I as bakers are always going to talk about gluten content, right? So no matter what your brand is, make sure you know the protein content of your flour. You can't look at the side of the bag and go, oh, it's got four grams of protein because that's based on daily value. That has nothing to do with us as bakers. So make sure you got in touch with your, your um, flour company, whatever brand you choose, and get the protein content. So what I'm looking for this is somewhere between 11%, maybe 12%, somewhere in there. Again, King Arthur's 11.7 for its all purpose. We put our stuff in the bag, which is super cool because then you can be an informed baker. But check that out. I find that if you are using another, another brand, um, I made this at a friend's house and I used an off-brand, off-brand to me, I suppose, bread flour. And I got a better result than an, uh, an, a different brand of all purpose. They tend to be a little wimpier. So let's talk about what gluten feels like in the mouth next, if that's okay. So the way I like to think about it is all purpose is Goldilocks. It's right smack dab in the middle, Goldilocks. You can do a lot of things with it. it depends on your hand skills. With proper hand skills, you can make a great baguette. You can make a, a, a pie crust. It'll happen. As we move forward and up, we've got bread flour moving up in gluten content. King Arthur's 12.7, and then up to the highest is the high gluten flour, King Arthur's 14%. So think about the texture of a bagel. That I feel is the texture of gluten. You are chewing on it, you're working hard to eat it. Moving back to the center and going down the spectrum, we have pastry flour next, King Arthur's about 9%, and then the very wimpy, wimpy bottom is about eight for cake flour. Think about the texture of a cake. You can barely pick it up without it falling off your fork. Compare and contrast in your mind the texture of cake and the texture of bagel. And there you've got your gas pedal for texture. As you level up, you're gonna get more chewy. As you level down, you're gonna get more tender. So if I'm doing something like this, it's more like a focaccia in my mind. It's got that nice thick, then I really like, I can go down to a lower protein double lot and really, really enjoy it. If I am wanting this to have a little more height, I might use a bread flour and get more rice because it's got more muscle. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. Anything else for you? Life is good. Life is good. Are you ahead of schedule? I was ahead of schedule by like two minutes. Unbelievable. Woo! We have, woo!
We have a couple questions for you though, John. Before sure. you go. Um, a couple of people in the chat wanted to know about the um, sauce that you use. They were interested in your tomato sauce. Yeah, so this is um, just crushed tomatoes, basil, salt, pepper, um, and then it's strained. So it's not cooked off. It's not cooked off. Okay. No, no, it's not cooked off, but it's what we like to use here at the baking school. So it's yummy. It's fresh. Yum, yum. That's yeah. And then another question we keep getting is about parbaked. And I do mine sometimes. I parbake it one to save time and two to just if I have more pizzas, but maybe you can share your opinion on parbaked and give some people some thoughts. Yeah, a parbake would definitely get you a crustier bottom. So my bottom on this, and I know it's because I was making baguettes, my bottom's a little light. This camera angle is a little bit darker. I'm not tan. I'm in the Pacific Northwest. This forward mm -hmm. camera's a little um, a little darker. So if, if I had my perfect, I would want this to be a little darker on the bottom. And par baking would be a great way to get that because you get a second blast of heat. Um, do it. I would do it for uh, 12 to 15 minutes until the starches are well set. And then you can use it the next day, put it back in, put the cheese on it, grizzle it up. Can you do par baked in the same day, like 10 minutes and then pull it out and wait 30 yeah. minutes and then do it? Heck yeah. Do it, do it. Do it, do it. Thank you. Anything else? No, I just love, I just love talking about crusty bottoms. You and me both, brother. There we go. Jen, I love your, I, you know, I love your, I love the littles. I love, I, I love your, I love your presentation. Thank you so much for uh, taking this time out and, uh, you know, rolling us through the, uh, the stretch and folds and the, the beautiful deep dish. And this was the winner of last year's recipe for King Arthur. Is that correct? Yeah, this was our recipe of the year for 2020. Thank God this got me through COVID, at least up until now. So I'm so happy to get to share it with you. And hopefully you guys will make some and enjoy it. Woo I love it. I love it. Thank you so very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Well, it looks like Jen, because uh, she rocked it, she brought us back on to schedule. I know that Noel and Nicole were trying to keep this going as long as possible. However, thanks to Jenny, uh, it, you know, that's just not going to happen at King Arthur. So how are we doing, guys? Uh, Nicole, what's going on in this chat? I feel like a lot of people, thank you, Just. Uh, my name, bro, always, always looking out for those crusty bottoms. Speaking of, I'm, I've just been working on my, so I've just been working on a couple Frico crusts of my own here. I mean, obviously, I mean, just look at that crown. I mean, come on. I mean, just, yeah, just trying yeah, to go. Yeah, that's See, awesome. that's, oh, uh, it's perfect. That's going to win. I you mean, got that. You no. You got that in Japan in the fake food section. No, <laughs> tell Justin Leong, you're going to get stung by that scorpion tail, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> going to get stung. So I was working on that a little bit.